Hi there. In the second lecture on entrepreneurial law, we're going to be looking at the necessity for laws and governance in companies. A lot of people say, look, the entrepreneurs are doing a wonderful job in South Africa. We should leave them alone and let them get on with their job. Why should they be bothered with tax returns and corporate governance and observing the Companies Act? Well, let's go into that and see where you really live. The problem that we have in South Africa today is we're not growing fast enough. That's in our economy. We've tanked from having positive growth rates, lovely stuff up until 2009, and then it all tanked down to about zero at the moment. And that's just not good enough to feed our population. Last year, world famous economist Thomas Piketty came to South Africa. Everybody went along expecting that he'd be able to tell us wonderful miracle cures for the problems that we face in our economy. And he wasn't very sympathetic. It went something like this. If you go by Cape Town economist Murray Labrand, at the dawn of apartheid, the top 1% of South Africa earned 20% of the income. That declined actually by the end of apartheid to 1% of the population earned 10% of the income. But today, we have the position that 1% of the population earns 20% of the income again, and the equality gap is actually widening. We, meanwhile, are arguing about the income debacle. So we will say to you that we've been arguing for 2,000 days, and it's been great fun in Parliament. During that time, South Africa has been producing about 1.2 million babies a year. So that's about 3,300 new South Africans every day. So, over 6 million babies have arrived since the Nkanda debacle started. That's enough to fill the Calabash Stadium 60 times over. We are having a virtual baby shower in South Africa and our population is growing faster than our economy. <laughs> and in Parliament, we argue about Nkandla. So there are the growth rates of South Africa as various people have predicted. Now, Trevor Manuel, who designed the National Development Plan, went for the grey line. He said South Africa's population was going to stagnate at about 60 million. Latest indications are that we've already hit 56 million, and by 2030, we're going to be somewhere up by 64 million South Africans. One would think that South Africa will die under the grant system. We won't be able to afford it all. Actually, the grant system is becoming more and more affordable. The problem in South Africa today is what we call the missing middle. That's the group aged 14 to 65. That population is growing very quickly, and there are not enough jobs to go around. And so we get this. What's your birthday present in South Africa when you turn 19? Most have the end of their child grant. Their education system is not working, and youth unemployment is rampant. Piketty doesn't have the answer for that. He's looking at Europe and America, where their populations are not growing. So what we are having to do is to say, how do we make it grow? Now, there was the man of the moment for 13 years, Trevor Manuel. He had a comparatively easy time as Minister of Finance. Because while Trevor Manuel was Minister of Finance, tax receipts were outstripping national expenditure. And that was all fine and dandy. We could afford what we wanted and even reduce our national debt. But that quickly reversed after the financial crisis of 2009. And ever since, we have been trying to manage our expenditure to come somewhere down towards our tax collections so that our country is not overborrowed. Now, what you are seeing is that this problem emerged post-2009. Initially, we were allowed to borrow. We had space to borrow. But the debt trajectory of South Africa kept on moving upwards. There's the original prediction in 2012, 2013, 2014. It had gone exponential. So what happened in 2014 was that we had to bring in what's called austerity. South Africa had to reduce its expenditure, collect more taxes, 
and not borrow so much. Now that was implemented by Finance Minister Nene, 22 October 2014. There's the announcement. And what followed was an attempt to level off the national debt trajectory which went so high during 2011-12. But the efforts that have been made have not been enough and we continue to be in a very frightening position that even this year with Pravin Gordon back as Minister of Finance, we are looking that our national debt percentage is about 3,5% of GDP. That's unacceptable. Gordon has said, well, that's the worst point position and we will get better. He says that every year. What we are saying is that even with the new measures in South Africa, South Africa's debt trajectory is higher than it was initially forecast. So, we are facing downgrade to junk status. What do we get? National Treasury believes that it can hold off the threat. It said it overestimated the slippage of tax collections because nobody really knows where that national debt number is going. There's the IMF predictions of 2014. Well, South Africa's national debts have never been anywhere near it ever since. We thought we were okay early in 2016, and that was before the other debacles that we've had across this year, such as the knock-on effect of Brexit and the knock-on effect of the never-ending SARS wars between Magnani and Gordon. Tax buoyancy remains quite high. We are hoping that when we get to the October figures for the first six months, which are announced at the Medium Term Budget Framework speech, we'll be able to show that it's not as bad as some would make it out. So we have say, South Africa has three major taxes. They increase every year by more than inflation. That's personal income tax, VAT and corporate tax. There are a range of other little taxes that are imposed in various ways across South Africa, but they are small in relation to the three big ones. That's all that is holding South Africa together. When it comes to all businesses, they are integrally involved in collecting South Africa's taxes, and it is absolutely essential that they are managed properly because they are acting as agents of government to get the money in that we so desperately need. Now, here's the big point. What is South Africa's biggest threat? It's population. As the population is growing now, South Africa will have to create another 9 million jobs in the next 50 years. If we don't, there could be social chaos. In fact, that is what is predicted. So what we are saying is that we need entrepreneurs like never before to grow businesses bigger and bigger so that we can employ more people and provide social stability in South Africa. That's the challenge. But what is business's responsibility in all of this? Now, if you go back to the, the publication of Capitalism and Freedom, 1962, Milton Friedman. He, he published that when I was one year old. And he was the laureate economist for many, many years. People followed him. And this is what he said. He said, the best economic climate in which a business can exist is a privatized and deregulated that increases competition, which increases quality and reduces prices. Now that's good old Adam Smith stuff. Perfect, lovely ideals. But Milton Friedman took it further. He says, there is one and only one social responsibility of business, to use its resources and engage in its activities in a way that is designed to increase its profits. That's all business has to do, says Friedman. And he says, that's okay, so long as we stay within the rules of the game, which is to say that you engage in open and free competition without deception or fraud. That's how he was talking back in the 60s and 70s. It didn't work. It was adopted by Reagan and Thatcher back in the 1980s, before many of you were born. And there were great social calamities as a result of it. Milton Friedman never really took into account the knock-on effect of his policies. He also didn't take into account that businesses were not able to regulate themselves. 
So, in the early 2000s, we had the Enron debacle, where businesses simply bent the rules and did not carry on business without deception or fraud, as was specified by Milton Friedman. The result was it eventually collapsed. The same thing came along 10 years later with the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the loss of billions and billions of individuals' money in pension funds and outside of pension funds. So obviously Friedman doesn't work. We also see this debate today in the ongoing war about the tax affairs of eBay, Google, Starbucks and others. Are they doing the right thing? Or are they simply engineering their companies in a way that can get around the payment of taxes? We'll discuss that in class in further detail. So, if we go back to some income tax cases, such as the Escher Pullman case, it says, His Majesty's subjects are free, if they can, to make their own arrangements so that their cases may fall outside the taxing acts. They incur no penalties and, strictly speaking, no moral censure. If, having considered the lines drawn by the legislature for imposing taxes, they make it their business to walk outside it. So that means it's a free-for-all. If you can beat SARS, then you are a winner in business. Well, we're moving beyond that now. Things are changing. We have always spoken about shareholders who own companies. The view on that has changed enormously today. We don't own a company. A shareholding is a position where you have a right to a dividend and a right to a vote. It doesn't convey ownership. But we're also bringing somebody else into the room. It's not only about shareholders and companies. It's all about society. And collectively, we're going to talk about them as being the stakeholders. Now, the stakeholder is like the elephant in the room. He doesn't own the business. Nobody actually owns a company. But he wants a fair deal from business. He wants to measure the profit that a business is making versus what is it taking from society in making it. And that is the big new debate that we've got to watch out for. So Professor Henry Mintzberg and friends says, corporations are economic entities to be sure, but they are also social institutions, and they must justify their existence by their contribution to society. They can't just leave everything up to the regulator. Now, when it comes to business decisions, this changes things enormously. We've sold millions of MBAs over many, many years by looking at efficiency and profit only. The real doggy dog stuff that made business schools very famous. But now it gets more difficult. We have to introduce a new spectrum. The social spectrum is something morally right and justifiable. And like good managers, we start marking off our positions on these spectrums. And if we're really clever, we can invert those spectrums. What does this tell you? It says the old type of leadership. Let's put Donald Trump there or David Cameron, recently departed as Prime Minister of England. They were talking about efficiency, saving. How can we run it purely by the book? The new lot that are coming along, the likes of Trump, the new lot that are coming along, the likes of Piketty and Bernie Sanders in America, are saying, no ways. That's not good enough. We've got to take this a little bit further. We've got to look at the social spectrum. So what they are saying is that worst practice is a business that is not profitable and is also unfair and inequitable. The benchmark, the starting place in business, is where your business is profitable and at least it's legal. But what we are looking for is best practice, where your business is both legal morally fair, and it's making money. Now, that changes things enormously. We're going to have to see if the Clintons are going to be able to understand all of this when they go into the White House. The jury's out on that. We'll see which way they go. But the big thing is that for a business to be correct today, we are saying, first of all, it has to be on the right side of the law. Then it must also be morally correct. And it must be legal. 
This is going far further than we used to go in business, and it creates a smaller playing field. But that's just the way it is. So now, what happens if a business is morally fair, but it is illegal? So let's give two examples here. Illegal abortions, and let's give another example of trading in marijuana. Some people say that's morally right, but legally wrong. So what do we do about it? Well, the courts aren't going to help you with this. If you're on the wrong side of the law, you're on the wrong side of the law, no matter what the moral case may be. If you look at the Cool Ideas case recently decided in the Constitutional Court, it says it cannot be expected of a court of law in such circumstances to disregard a clear statutory prohibition. That would be inimicable to the principle of legality and the rule of law. To do so would amount to nothing more than undermining the legislation. So if somebody has got a problem with the morality of the law, then the remedy is actually to take that law and challenge it before the Constitutional Court. But until such time as the Constitutional Court sets it aside or Parliament changes it, that's the law and that's what we've got to obey. So there is your spectrum that we're going to have to work with. We are looking for best practice that is profitable, legal, morally justifiable, fair and equitable. And that's a small playing field that we've got to work with. So how do we do this? There's this great big challenge. How do we go about actually remedying it? The Rhodes Business School, we've got a little daisy wheel. We say, first of all, we've got to look at the economy. The company has got to make profits to be sustainable. And managers have to relate to the needs, interests, and the expectation of shareholders. You've got to do that. Otherwise, the shareholders are not going to put up the money. You've got to be profitable as an entrepreneur before you even start. But it goes further. Next up comes ethics. In every business, we have to balance the demands of shareholders against the expectation of stakeholders. Or in short, how much profit are you making versus the cost of making it? But we're not finished yet. Then comes that future leaders must view the world in an integrated, holistic and critical way. We have to look at the ecology and how your business works with that. And finally comes equity, where organizations operate effectively if leaders know and understand fundamental management functions and practices. Now we put all of those together in a pinwheel. And the values of the Rhodes Business School are to teach core management skills and functions, responsible leadership and governance, the business and moral case for sustainability, all coupled with thought leadership and research. That's what we're about at the Rhodes Business School. Now, we're going to take that further in future modules. What you've got to look at with this is that no business can be doing too much wrong if it obeys the law for starters and it is profitable. We'll also have to bring into that how we can take the governance to an even higher standard. Join me in the next lecture. I'm Matthew Lester at the Rhodes Business School.